On June 30th, 1956, commercial passenger aviation changed forever. At the time, the deadliest aviation accident to ever occur unfolded in the skies above the natural wonder known as the Grand Canyon. The lives of 128 people were tragically cut short as the wreckage of two different planes were found nestled in various parts of the Grand Canyon. When investigators pieced together the events of that day, they discovered massive oversights, holes in safety, and the lack of necessary systems to keep passengers safe. Post-World War II, the aviation industry sought out ways to expand passenger services all over the world. The advancement of technology, partly induced by the war, led to the development of faster, more reliable planes. By the mid-1950s, more people were turning up to the airport to fly across country and no country did it better than the United States. Whereas crossing the continent-wide country used to take a lot longer, sometimes even days, traveling direct between Los Angeles and New York became a reality and more and more airlines were taking advantage of the times. Of course, flying was expensive at the time. It wasn't the mundane facet of life that it sometimes feels like it is today. Flying was an event, and people used to dress for the occasion. The United States, after the war, became economically prosperous, and many people benefited from that, so long as you fitted into certain demographics, that is. More people were making more money, and therefore more people could fly, and airlines were keen to draw in new travelers. You'll often hear people talk about this era in aviation as the Golden Age, if the vintage footage is anything to go by, it's easy to think that. But it wasn't all smooth flying. Plane crashes were far more common, and in an age before flight recorders and fancy technology, it was often difficult for investigators to truly understand what happened in those accidents. Which when you think about it like that, perhaps slowed the progress of safety somewhat. This, however, didn't stop manufacturers building bigger, faster, more comfortable, and more reliable planes. By their standards at the time, anyway. With more passengers came more aircraft, with more aircraft came bigger airports, which only induced a greater flow of aircraft, which incentivized bigger planes. Which brings us to the first of two planes we need to discuss for this video possibly the most iconic plane of this vintage era in aviation, the Lockheed L-1049 Super Constellation. To those in the know, it is simply known as the Connie. This plane was actually the latest model of the Constellation family developed by Lockheed. These planes were first developed right at the onset of the Second World War, and of course, they were brought into military service in the 1940s. Following the war, like many planes, they were brought over into civilian aviation, and the plane was developed further, resulting in the Super Constellation, launching in 1951. This, this plane, was a technological marvel at the time. With its distinctive three-pronged tail structure and curvy design, this aircraft could fly higher, further, and faster than most other planes that came before it. In fact, most of the fighter planes of the Second World War wouldn't have been able to keep up with it, it was so quick. It was one of the first planes to feature a pressurized cabin, allowing it to fly above most weather, making for smoother journeys. In the United States though, where the Super Connie really excelled was in its range. It was the first plane to fly regular direct flights coast to coast non-stop, connecting millions of people with just one flight. It was an impressive machine at the time, and the international aviation community thought the same, and so over 300 super constellations were built. One of the primary customers of the plane was Transworld Airlines. But before we go any further, maybe we should perhaps introduce the other plane that is of importance today. Enter the Douglas DC-7. 
Douglas had been a mainstay in the aviation business for decades, the company dating back to the early 1920s. The DC-7 was the latest in their line of four-engine prop liners. Douglas had already revolutionized the aviation industry in the 1930s, setting the bar for air transportation at the time. However, it was with the introduction of the DC-4 in 1942 that a step into the production of larger aircraft was made at Douglas. Many of the design elements were brought over from the DC-4 into the DC-6, which was partly developed to compete and keep up with the first constellations from Lockheed. Improvements to the Douglas design came again with the introduction of the DC-7 which arrived in 1953, again retaining many of the design elements. With newer engines and redesigned propeller blades, the DC-7 could fly further than any other plane of its day, with a range of around 5,000 miles, outflying its rival the Super Constellation in that regard. It was also faster than the Constellation too. One airline that stayed loyal with Douglas throughout this expansive time in aviation history was United Airlines. They were the prime operator of the DC-7, and at the time, the plane was their flagship. Now that we've introduced these two planes, we need to turn our attention to the American West Coast, Los Angeles. These two carriers, United and Transworld Airlines, had their preferences when it came to base of operations. Whereas United operated out of Los Angeles as default among other cities, TWA preferred the Midwest and East Coast, but did connect to LAX from their then at the time headquarters in Kansas City. Which brings us to the beginning of the accident on June 30th, 1956. At LAX that day, there were two planes, a TWA Constellation and a United Airlines Douglas DC-7, and a total of 128 people turned up at the airport that day to take these two flights. TWA was operating Flight 2 to Kansas City, with 70 passengers and crew, whereas United was operating Flight 718 direct to Chicago with 58. The flight crews of both planes consisted of three pilots each. First, let's break down the crew of the TWA Constellation. 41-year-old Captain Jack Gandhi had logged nearly 15,000 fly hours by the time of this accident, and he was a well-respected captain. When it came to the LA to Kansas City route, he had made the journey a total of 177 times. He knew the route and the LA airspace well. His first officer was 31-year-old James Rittner. He was the least experienced in the cockpit of the Constellation that day. He only joined the airline in 1952 and had logged around 800 hours in the plane. The third pilot was of course the flight engineer 37-year-old Forrest Brayfogle. When it came to the Constellation, he had spent the most time in it compared to the other two pilots, with over 7,000 hours in the type. The accident report does note that there was a fourth pilot on board, a flight engineer by the name of Harry Allen, who was not on duty and it's unknown if he was in the cockpit. Switching over to the United DC-7, 48-year-old Captain Robert Shirley had been flying for United since 1937. He was a popular captain at the airline and his work colleagues got along well with him. Everyone called him Bob. He had logged around 16,500 fly hours by the time of the accident. One could consider him a master of aviation. He was among that very exclusive club of people in the 1950s to actually own his own airplane. He was joined in the cockpit that day by 36-year-old First Officer Robert Harms, a former pilot of the Second World War. Harms was the youngest member of the United crew. Again, the third pilot here was the flight engineer, 39-year-old Gerard Fior. Compared to the other two pilots, he had the least experience on the then-new DC-7, with less than 200 hours in the type. He knew a lot about airplanes though, he joined United as a mechanic in 1948, before becoming a flight engineer in 1951. With all of that said, we have laid out the background of both of these planes. 
Before really delving into this accident, you could look at this and feel a bit confused about how these two planes actually collided in the air. The TWA left before the United. How did they collide when in theory the TWA should have been much further ahead? Well, we'll get to that. So first, let's take a look at the flight plans of these two planes departing LAX. It was a busy Saturday morning at the airport on June 30th, 1956, and planes were taking off to the west. By 9am, the TWA constellation flying as Flight 2 was on the runway preparing for departure. There was actually a small delay on the ground due to last minute maintenance, so the TWA was a few minutes late. By 9.01, they were airborne. Once leaving the runway, the TWA was to fly via a certain airway that would take them northeast initially after takeoff. Their first waypoint was at Daggett in the California desert. Their next waypoint was all the way in Colorado at the town of Trinidad, near to the border with New Mexico. They would, however, continue to report their position en route. But knowing that the accident occurred much west of this, before the plane made it as far as Colorado, the rest of the flight plan is rather irrelevant. So let's take a closer look at what the United DC-7 was doing that day. Flying as United Airlines Flight 718, the DC-7 was just behind the TWA constellation. The United got airborne at 9.04, again departing to the west. After takeoff, Captain Bob Shirley needed to make a nearly 180 degree turn and fly towards Palm Springs. From there, they would turn northeast to intercept their next waypoint at Needles, which sits on the border with Arizona. Their next waypoint was at Arizona's Painted Desert, and the United plane wouldn't make it to this waypoint. But we should at least talk a little bit more about Painted Desert. You see, this wasn't really a waypoint so much as it was a line an arbitrary boundary that was drawn between two other points, and this became known as the Painted Desert Line. It was a rather large line at that, with those two points being positioned at Winslow in Arizona and Bryce Canyon in Utah. It was a common checkpoint for aircraft leaving Los Angeles. The United plane was to check in and report here on their way to their next waypoint in Durango, Colorado. As you can clearly see on the map, the TWA constellation was also going to cross the Painted Desert Line at roughly the same point and, as would soon become evident, at the same time too. So looking at these two flight plans overlaid on the map, logically you could assume, without much more information, that the two planes collided here, where the two paths intersect. However, that's not quite right. The disaster, evidently, occurred over the Grand Canyon, where the two planes should have been dozens of miles away from each other and at different altitudes, more on that in a moment, but the question now is how did these two planes actually cross paths? The thing is, back in 1956, pilots had a lot more freedom to kind of fly where they pleased, so long as they checked in with their scheduled waypoints. Things were so much different back then that apparently pilots didn't even communicate with air traffic controllers outside of takeoff and landing. Rather, they communicated to their own airline's operation center, who then forwarded information to controllers. So given that pilots could just deviate from their flight plan, what reasons would they have to do so? Well, on that day, there may have been a perfectly reasonable explanation. It was a rather cloudy day and perhaps the pilots were concerned with weather. Naturally, pilots want to avoid bad weather. So when United Flight 718 spotted potential thunderstorms ahead of their position, they just flew around them. The flight crew of TWA Flight 2 may also have been concerned about the weather. In fact, let's take another look at this flight. They were assigned a cruise altitude of 19,000 feet and were guided through overcast weather with the aid of air traffic control. Once passing Daggett at 9.21, which was reported to TWA operations, the pilots of Flight 2 wanted to get above the weather. 
To do this, they requested a new flight level of 21,000 feet. When the request to climb was relayed to ATC, they were actually denied the request. The reason for this was because of the presence of other traffic at 21,000 feet. And what plane was there? United Airlines Flight 718. The Douglas DC-7 had already been cleared for 21,000 feet, and even though the planes in theory should have been far enough apart, controllers still denied Flight 2's request to climb. This, however, did not stop the TWA crew. What happened instead is that they deviated again from their flight plan in a way they would be taken off instrument flying and into a see and be seen visual flight rules. So now the TWA had a responsibility to stay clear of other traffic and was also told to report seeing the United plane. And according to the accident report, the TWA reported the United traffic in sight. Evidently, as we'll soon find out, the plane would disappear out of view. With that, Captain Jack Gandhi of the TWA Constellation was able to climb to the suitable altitude they desired. They followed what was called the 1000 on top rule. It was pretty simple. It was the altitude 1000 feet above the tops of the clouds, which in this case just happened to take them up to 21,000 feet, the same altitude as United Airlines Flight 718. At 9.58, United 718 reported passing their waypoint at Needles. Further north, at roughly the same time, TWA2 was passing Las Vegas to the south. This was reported at 9.59, both planes expecting to reach the Painted Desert Line at roughly 10.30. Because of the lack of direct contact between the planes and controllers, and the lag of time induced by the archaic system of airlines handling radio communications, no one really noticed the clear collision scenario that had just surfaced. Sure, this all explains how the two planes ended up at the same altitude, but it still doesn't really explain why the wreckage of the planes was later found inside of the Grand Canyon. So it would appear that at some point, both aircraft seemed to clearly fly off course away from their flight paths. But why? In an era before flight recorders, we just don't know why for certain, as investigators couldn't come to a factual conclusion as to why the collision occurred with a discrepancy of roughly 17 miles from this crossover point. But there are theories. One possibility, which we've sort of already touched on, is that the pilots simply wanted to avoid weather. Naturally, this could easily lead to a spontaneous change in heading. Another possibility was the wind blowing and slowing the planes. But the one possibility, which seems to stand out, involves the notable geological feature local to the area. The airline industry in the 1950s was a fledgling business. Airlines wanted more people to fly, and a way they could achieve that was to advertise something you would never get anywhere else. Breathtaking aerial views of the Grand Canyon was one of those. It was common for pilots to give their passengers what they wanted, and sightseeing detours were common. So it is well within the realm of possibility that this is how the two planes crossed paths. The pilots of both planes went on a sightseeing trip of the Grand Canyon. However, we can delve a bit deeper. You see, as mentioned, the pilots in the TWA constellation from this point onward would never actually see the United plane, and we'll come back as to why they couldn't in just a bit. But it begs the question, could the pilots of the United DC-7 see the TWA? In theory, the answer to that is yes. Clearly though, they didn't, and there are no shortage of theories for this as well. After the accident, many people would point out that aircraft manufacturers of the time made cockpits where it may have been difficult to see certain areas out of the window from where the pilots were sitting, creating sort of blind spots. But of course, there are other reasons as to why the United crew 
may not have seen the constellation in their path. They could have been preoccupied with flight deck duties, or as many people appear to assume, cloud obscured the view, shrouding the two planes from one another until that final moment. It is strongly believed that the TWA came into view just a little too late. The region of the Grand Canyon where the collision occurred was more towards the eastern side, nearby to Char Butte, a nearly two kilometer tall summit in the canyon. The collision course of the two planes was as follows. The TWA was flying eastbound towards and over the Grand Canyon. You could sort of imagine the United as being behind them. In actuality, they were slightly to the south, approaching the constellation at an angle. This is why Captain Gandhi and his crew would never have been able to see the United DC-7 in this moment. It was behind them. Try to imagine, for a moment, what it must have felt like to the pilots of the United Douglas. Totally unexpected, this massive plane just seemingly emerges from the cloud right in front of them. Frantically, Captain Shirley banks his plane to the right and pushes the nose forward in an attempt to avoid the constellation. He was, however, too late. The outer section of the left wing sliced into the aft end of the constellation's fuselage, destroying the tail structure. In this moment, the tail section separated from the rest of the constellation. The tail fell to the canyon below, as did the remainder of the TWA, which just plummeted straight down to the bottom of the canyon. The United DC-7 had suffered a massive structural failure of the left wing. It too fell into a nosedive, with the pilots desperately trying to control their plane. They would have struggled as the plane now had a strong tendency to roll to the left. With absence of half of the left wing, it was not producing anywhere near as much lift as it did before the collision, compared to the right wing, which was unharmed upon impact. It continued to function as normal, leading to this imbalance of lift, which the pilots had absolutely no way to control. According to a 1957 document, a scrambled radio transmission was made from the United DC-7 as it fell from the sky. First Officer Robert Harms spoke the words later deciphered by investigators to be Salt Lake 718 were going in. The voice of Captain Shirley could be heard in the background as he struggled with the controls. Moments later, the DC-7 crashed into the steep facade of Char Butte. 128 people on both of the two planes were killed. The Grand Canyon is a very remote place, especially so in 1956. No one knew the two planes were missing at first. Though radar was a thing in the 1950s, radar coverage over this region of the United States was minimal to non-existent. Suspicions would begin to mount as neither of the two planes reported passing the painted desert line. When neither of the two planes reported their next waypoints, this was when the gravity of the situation began to hit those on the ground. Transworld Airlines Flight 2 and United Airlines Flight 718 never turned up at their destinations either. It was clear that day that the two planes appeared to go missing, many first suspecting that bad weather was at play. Later that day, a sightseeing air tour pilot was flying through the Grand Canyon when they noticed a plume of black smoke emanating from nearby Temple Butte. Upon closer inspection, they discovered the first of many horrors, the unmistakable tail structure of the Lockheed constellation. The remains of the United plane were found the following day, scattered on the side of Char Butte. Investigators were able to quickly determine what had happened, the fact that one plane was red and the other was blue, clear markings that paint had been swapped allowed investigators to conclude how the two planes collided in the air. The United clipped the TWA from behind. News of the disaster quickly spread around the world. This was the deadliest air disaster to have ever occurred at the time, and it happened in the Grand Canyon. As you could probably expect with any disaster like this that makes such bold headlines, 
a lot of people began pointing fingers at a lot of different people. A lot of the blame was not laid at any of the pilots, but rather the air traffic controller, who allowed Captain Jack Gandhi of the TWA to go VFR and adhere to the 1000 on top rule. Journalists in the media and even TWA and United Airlines also blamed the controller. The investigation, though, highlighted that the controller really didn't do anything wrong. The two flight crews deviated from their flight plans to fly under visual flight rules, which wasn't against the rules at the time, and the accident report makes that clear. To quote, The board is therefore of the firm opinion, based on the weather conditions, company procedures, and good pilot practice, that both flights were operating according to rules prescribed for VFR conditions when the collision occurred. The accident was a big shock to the flying public. Just when concerns about safety began to ease about flying, news of primitive technology and a laissez-faire approach to flying and air traffic control led to sweeping changes in the aviation industry in the United States. Some did make note that the investigation may not have considered the human factors in the Grand Canyon disaster. It is a valid conclusion that the origin of the collision was Captain Jack Gandhi's decision to fly VFR. The problem being that the context of the time period and the system he was operating under allowed him to do such thing. As a result of this investigation, radar coverage was increased, and today, there isn't an inch of the United States that isn't under ATC radar. More funding was allocated to the industry to hire and train new air traffic controllers and increase the number of ground-based navigational aids. The technology itself was modernized and more sophisticated radar systems and displays were developed. At the time, airspace was split between civil aviation and military with different governing bodies and this remained in place even despite the Grand Canyon disaster. For about two years, that is, when another mid-air collision took place involving another United Airlines DC-7. It was a passenger plane that collided with an F-100 fighter jet, killing a further 49 people. After that accident, the Federal Aviation Administration was formed, with authority over all airspace in the United States. The so-called 1000 on top rule was abolished, as was high altitude VFR flying, requiring all pilots in what is now known as Class A airspace to be in communication with controllers and have a filed IFR flight plan. The skies became much safer. But if you are a longtime viewer of the Disaster Breakdown channel, you may already know that mid-air collisions have still occurred. In fact, out of the accidents that fall into this category, the 1956 Grand Canyon disaster is the earliest we've looked at. The wreckage of the two planes, by the way, was not fully removed from the canyon until the 1970s. It also wasn't the last mid-air collision involving the Grand Canyon, but that is a story for another day. Fact is, this is complex and a collision could happen for any one of a number of reasons. Because the lessons learned in 1956 have never been forgotten, technology has improved substantially. Onboard traffic avoidance systems are now present on all commercial planes. But sometimes, it's only once we realize that there are holes in safety that we can prevent the next disaster from claiming more lives. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed or found it interesting, be sure to be subscribed as there is always a new video every Saturday. This one was always a video that I wanted to make and I think it turned out pretty well if I say so myself. There was lots to go over and I wanted to include some of the really nice looking photorealistic scenery you saw in the simulated segments of this video. It took a while to get working, but I think it was well worth it in the end, if you ask me. Anyway, I'm going to take a moment right now to thank my patrons over on Patreon for their ongoing support. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you see your name here, a massive thanks to you. If you yourself want to support the channel further and even get your name featured here at the end of the next video, 
you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube. Like patrons, they got this video on Thursday. If you want to chat and connect with me further, you can always send me a message on there, or there is always my personal Twitter page, which you'll also find in the pinned comment. That is all from me this week. Thank you all so much for watching. Have a great weekend, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.